everybody. I think uh, we've got uh, a point in time and, and a nice a nice crowd here. Welcome. Uh, thanks for taking the time to uh, to join us this morning. Uh, my name is Justin King. I work in the Asset Building Program at the New America Foundation. Uh, our work in the Asset Building Program is focused on significantly broadening access to economic resources uh, through increased savings and asset ownership, giving families enhanced economic security, uh, a direct stake in, in the American Commonwealth, and the means to pursue their aspirations. I'm, I'm very fortunate to be able to work with a group of congressmen and their staffs who also believe in savings and ownership are critical for the success of individual families, but also for the larger economy. And uh, today's briefing is sponsored by that group, the Congressional Savings and Ownership Caucus. Uh, and its co-chairs are Congressman Jim Cooper, Tom Petry, Joe Pitts, uh, and Congresswoman Nikki Saunders. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank their staff as well, Zach Marshall, Richard Markowitz, Josh Allhouse, and Sarah Stockerson, respectively. Uh, part of the mission of the caucus is to bring people together to explore and discuss ways to promote those critical concepts of saving and ownership. Uh, that doesn't constitute an endorsement of the ideas discussed, but without a safe space with a free exchange of ideas, it's nearly impossible to move forward with new solutions. Um, so, if those are the interests of the caucus, uh, why are we maybe here at an event called Saving the Post Office? There's no doubt the Post Office faces significant challenges. Uh, I don't have to work very hard to outline them. Uh, decline in mail volume, increased operating costs, the potential end of Saturday delivery, possible location closures, and a great deal of uncertainty about what will or won't happen here on Capitol Hill. As a matter of fact, as I speak, there are a number of current former postal workers who are engaged in a hunger strike to protest some of the uh, changes that are being contemplated for the agency. Uh, the big picture really boils down to this. Uh, what's the role of the Postal Service in the 21st century? In an increasingly electronic world of communication, how can the Postal Service best serve uh, this vast nation? Now, this issue of postal reform has commanded a great deal of attention recently. Uh, it's by no means the only pressing issue uh, facing the U.S. And the Postal Service aren't the only ones facing troubled balance sheets. Last week, the Federal Reserve released the results of its triennial examination of household balance sheets. The survey of consumer finances caused quite a stir with the headline that the average net worth, uh, the, the net worth of the average American fell by almost 40% from 2007 to 2010. And unfortunately, that staggering stat isn't the end of the bad news reported by the survey. That drop hit the poor the hardest, as the bottom 25% as measured by net worth essentially had their wealth erased entirely. The middle class suffered tremendously, and the biggest driver for most Americans in the decline in that net worth was the decline in the value of their homes. Some reports call this loss a loss in paper wealth. But when you dig into the survey, what you find is that that so-called paper wealth was actually the only type of wealth that those families had. Only about half of working Americans have a retirement account right now. And we can expect that fully a third of all Americans won't have any retirement savings at all uh, when they reach retirement age. Uh, one of the really interesting findings of the survey uh, is that there's been a tremendous attitude shift among the American people um, from that period of 2007 to 2010. The survey of consumer finances has been going on for a long time, and predictably, reliably, every time it comes out, they would ask people, what's your number one reason for saving? And invariably, the answer was always, I'm saving for my retirement. That's not the case anymore. The number one reason for the first time that people are saving, according to the recent survey of consumer finances, is they're saving for emergencies. People didn't have basic savings to fall back on when hard times hit. And the message that you need that has started to hit home with the American people. Has it hit home enough? Yesterday, Bankrate released the results of their annual financial security index. They've confirmed this long-standing pattern. 28% of Americans have no emergency savings at all. Almost 50% of Americans either have no savings or some savings but not enough to cover three months' worth of expenses, as experts recommend. This tracks very closely with what we in the asset building field call liquid asset poverty. And it correlates very strongly with negative outcomes for households and kids. Uh, 
The FDIC took a look at uh, the state of American household finances a few years ago as well. And one of their key findings is that more than 9 million American households simply don't have a checking or savings account. They're unbanked. Another 21 million are underbanked. They don't have transaction accounts, but they rely upon non-traditional financial services such as payday lenders, check cashers, and other services that are wealth stripping rather than wealth building. Coming out of the financial crisis, many Americans have started to pay down their debt and build their savings. But the experience in the asset building field, a look at our history, and our knowledge of human nature tells us that the, the current expansion of savings is both temporary and insufficient. If we don't change our institutions, and if we don't change the way that people access them, we are unlikely to change our behavior for long. Now the good news, if you want to call it that, is that the U.S. is not the first or the only country to have dealt with some of these challenges. We might well be able to apply lessons from other countries to address some of the issues facing the Postal Service, and at the same time, address the problem of unbanked Americans and a national lack of savings. That's the argument made by Professor Shel Guerin in his new book, Beyond Our Need, Why America Spends While the World Saves. Professor Guerin is a professor of history at Princeton, Beyond Our Means takes a historical look at the origins of saving in the U.S. and in the Western world, and early campaigns to promote thrift. He contrasts that history to the history of savings from different cultures, with an emphasis on extremely successful efforts in Japan, Germany, and France, nations that feature much higher savings rates than the United States, and all featured a well-developed postal savings network. Anybody can walk into a post office and in one of those countries and conduct their basic banking uh, and save money for emergencies uh, uh, supported by the public and open to everyone, which is a very different structure than what we see here in the US. Uh, this is a tremendously useful lens to look at some of our current challenges. I think there might be some real opportunity here, and I'm pleased to have you all here to be part of the discussion. I'm going to turn it over to Professor Garen, and after he's had a chance to share some of his insights with you, we'll open it up for discussion. Uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Garen. Uh, thank you, Justin, for the very kind introduction, and thank you all for coming today. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a topic that I've never talked about in isolation, although it is part, as Justin said, of an overall book I did on the history of saving and spending in many countries in the world. Uh, well, before I begin talking about postal savings, I want to get two things out of the way. Uh, the first is, let's face it, savings accounts at the post office is a pretty wacky idea. But as often happens in this country, what seems lunatic here is perfectly normal in the rest of the world. And I want to show you in my first slide, uh, as Justin just referred to, you can go in nearly every other country in the first world, and many of the large country, the countries in the developing world, like China, India, Brazil, uh, and one of the most commonplace appearances in a city or town is the local post office with uh, tellers set up especially to deal with various types of postal financial services. Uh, in China today, for example, the Chinese postal savings system has over 100 million households as customers. That's not just accounts, that's households. Uh, so these are very large. We're going to talk about the large Japanese system in a minute. So that's one thing I want to get out of the way. The second, um, I think Justin's already done my job for it, but it, it's to look at best practices in the world. As Americans, we don't tend to do that. Uh, and nowadays, if anybody said, well, there are things that are worth learning from Japan or Germany or France, uh, invariably the skeptic would say, well, what about the Euro crisis? What about Japan's 20-year uh, uh, history of economic stagnation? I think the important point here is that we're not talking about taking every aspect of these countries. We're talking about best practices, and no country in the world is perfect, including our own, and others uh, in the rest of the world said that they would never emulate American best practices because they didn't like this or that about America. Probably we would call them short-sighted and uncompetitive. So I'm making this plea for looking at best practices, looking at both the strong points as well as weak points of some of the global savings systems. 
around the world. And with that out of the way, I'd like to talk about the origins and the development of postal savings in the world, and then possible lessons that we as Americans might learn, uh, particularly, as Justin said, as we address these twin problems that most people would think are unrelated, the problem of inadequate facilities for small savers in this country and the current crisis of the U.S. Post Office. Well, let's talk about the origins first. Uh, postal savings emerged a long time ago, actually 150 years ago, and emerged as part of a broader movement to encourage ordinary people to save. Uh, elites in Europe and North America and Australia and other places believe that if working people regularly save in a bank, they will become self-reliant citizens who could plan their lives and avoid depending on welfare or turning to crime. Now, proponents, and this is in the 1800s, of, of thrift and of these various small savers institutions, they often use the word self-help. And we look back on that and we think, well, self-help must mean rugged individualism. You're on your own. But when proponents of self-help talked about it in the 19th century, they didn't mean that people were totally on their own. They meant that if people were going to save, they were going to be diligent, they were going to be thrifty, they would be facilities that would enable them to help themselves. So the, the story from the start, about 200 years ago, about promoting small saving among working people was not to simply say they're on their own, but to give them institutions that would help them to help themselves. Now, the first institution that was uh, established, that's my book, we want to talk about that, but, um, the first institution that was established to help people help themselves was something called the Savings Bank. Uh, which a few of you in the room may be able to remember. We had some here, although not as many as most. But the Savings Bank was founded about 200 years ago. Uh, it spread all over Europe, it spread to North America, it spread across oceans. Uh, the Savings Bank was set up by civic associations in cities, often by philanthropists. It was set up as an institution, not like a commercial bank, but a bank that would take very small savings of working people and pay interest on it. So often it involved some sort of subsidy from the city or from the philanthropist, but it was designed to enable the working poor to become self-reliant citizens. The problem with the savings banks, they worked quite well in some places, like Germany here on the world left, uh, but in many places like England, uh, they were insufficient. Where they existed, they did pretty well in terms of making people into savers, uh, but they didn't exist much in the countryside, they didn't exist in many urban neighborhoods. Also, the savings banks in the 1800s, this was true in our country as well, often went bust. They had insolvencies, they had embezzlement, uh, it was insecure. And one of the things that we learn in the history of saving is that people are much less likely to save uh, or put their money in banks if they think the banks are going to fail. So security and access were two very important problems. The savings banks started to solve them, but clearly were insufficient. So as a result, a new institution came into effect uh, in the middle of the 19th century called the Postal Savings Bank, or the Post Office Savings Bank. Uh, the idea originated in Britain. Uh, it was passed by the Parliament in 1861. Uh, the idea of the Postal Savings Bank was actually a brilliant idea in terms of its simplicity. Uh, it said rather than depend on spotty coverage by savings banks, uh, why not use the Post Office? Post offices at that point, Britain and elsewhere, were rapidly expanding. Post office was highly accessible. Use the post office as the savings bank for most lower income people. So you solve the problem of nationwide access. A post office literally was usually within a few miles of anyone's home. That solved one problem. The second problem it solved was the problem of security. Because unlike commercial banks or savings banks, the postal savings account was guaranteed by the state, by the central government. Uh, so that also was very important in persuading people to actually deposit their surplus, their savings. And the third aspect of the Postal Savings Bank is because the networks were so extensive, because the amounts of deposits, although tiny in the aggregate, were quite large, there were certain economies of scale that allowed the Post Office Savings Bank to accept very small deposits. This was very important to the working poor, that they could make regular but small deposits, they could build up their assets, 
and be able to plan their lives better. Uh, and also they paid interest. And the interest was interesting because it was paid directly from state profits. So in a sense, at times it was a subsidy, at times it was above market rates, but that's because the Post Office Savings Bank was set up not to be a market financial institution, but to be a social institution designed to do a social good, so often to have a small subsidy to the interest rates. And these post office savings banks spread throughout Europe in the middle of the 19th century. Uh, you can see up there that uh, they spread to Canada, uh, they spread to most European nations uh, by the 1870s and 1880s. And one particular nation stood out, and that was the non-Western nation in this equation, that was Japan. Far off Japan, just becoming a modernized state at that point, uh, adopted the British post office savings system in 1875, and in a sense, the rest is history. Japanese postal savings system today is not only the world's largest postal savings system, it's actually the world's largest bank. Now that may be a problem, we'll get to that later. Um, postal savings was very, very important in accomplishing what today we call financial inclusion. In other words, trying to get lots of people on the margins, poor people, children, women, people who have been passed by by the commercial banking sector to get them into the banking system. It was very successful, uh, and particularly with respect to children. Postal savings, and this is something I think we should pay attention to today, postal savings is a very good mechanism for encouraging youth saving. The idea in the 1800s, and the idea today it should be, that if you want people to be responsible financial actors as adults, they need financial education as youth. And so in the 1800s, financial education is not returned, but they were called school savings banks. And uh, children would do what these Australian children are doing at the bottom on Monday morning, uh, all around uh, the uh, developing world at the time, uh, children would bring their small coins to school. They would give it to teachers or often to postal savings bank employees or savings bank employees, and then it would be deposited in their accounts. It was designed to teach them these habits. The post office was a very good mechanism. It would take, again, the very small deposits of children, it would cultivate them as savers um, and as responsible financial actors. And as I said, postal employees would often go and work with the school system. So you would have comprehensive nationwide systems of school savings. Uh, so post office, uh, the postal savings could be very important in that respect. Well, let's turn to the United States. What's the history of the United States uh, with postal savings? Uh, and believe it or not, it does have a history. Uh, again, first of all, with the problem of the US having a checkered history of postal savings. Because when other nations around the world in the 1860s, 1870s, 1880s, were adopting postal savings, the United States stood out as an exception. Uh, the po a postal savings bill was actually considered in the U.S. Congress as early as 1873. It was considered in 1874, and it was considered actually for the next 37 years, all the way to 1909. All the time, it was either, um, uh, uh, it was either rejected or pigeonholed. Uh, so there was much more resistance to postal savings in this country. And as a result, and a result of also other savings institutions not being particularly widespread, or at least for small savers, you can see as an international comparison uh, where the United States stood in 1910. Uh, and in terms of, this is a rough measure of financial inclusion. In other words, what's the percentage of savings accounts per population? And you can see that most of the countries that had both active savings banks but also postal savings systems uh, had quite high rates of financial inclusion as accounts per population, mainly in the 30 percentile, whether it was in European countries or Japan. You can see the United States is way down. In terms of its savings banks, this is before that postal savings bank, only about 10 percent of the population at most had savings accounts. If you throw in all the savings accounts in commercial banks, which is really cheap, it's not a good comparison, the United States is still an outlier. It's still only about 16%. So it was in these circumstances that a number of reformers, as I said, in the U.S. Congress, but also in the U.S. Postmaster General's office, began in the 1870s, tried to enact a postal savings here, because it was quite obvious that the U.S. needed what the Europeans and the Japanese were doing if they wanted to create institutions small savers. 
But, as I said before, in the U.S. Congress, the Postal Savings Legislation for 37 years faced formidable opposition. Uh, the lead opponent, as you might guess, uh, were the commercial banks, which were much better developed in the U.S. at that point than in most countries. Uh, and already the American Bankers Association had been formed in the 1870s, and they mounted a very vigorous lobby. They did not want the competition of the Postal Savings Bank, even though they themselves were not particularly serving small customers well. Regional interests uh, were skeptical of a postal savings law because they feared uh, it would mean that the money, and this is important, that the money that was deposited would all go into the coffers of the U.S. Treasury uh, and take it away from the state. So there were those, those sorts of opposition. It was formidable. Finally, in 1907, there was a major financial panic in the United States. Many banks failed. And that was just enough to push Congress into enacting a very weak postal savings bill, but one that was heavily compromised, that looked really nothing like the postal savings legislation elsewhere. Uh, so in 1910, uh, postal savings is passed. Uh, this is, you would have to say, one of the great forgettable moments in American history. Uh, from 1911 to 1966, believe it or not, and I often have to tell people who even lived through that period that there was a postal savings bank, it seemed to be rather invisible, at least toward the end. Now, it did accomplish a few things. Uh, it was highly appealing uh, to immigrant communities, particularly immigrants from Italy, Austro-Hungarian Empire, and other places where they had come from countries with postal savings banks, and they trusted them. Uh, it was uh, somewhat uh, uh, popular with farmers, particularly during the Great Depression in the 1930s when banks were falling all over the place. The postal savings was your guaranteed place. Um, but it never really caught on to the great mass of the American public. And there were some reasons for that. One, unlike the European and Japanese systems, uh, the U.S. postal savings system from the start was crippled because it, it was not, it, it was uh, prevented from, uh, from paying interest that was anywhere near what other banks were paying, uh, it paid about 1% effective interest on accounts at a time when banks were paying between 3 and 4%. So it was kind of almost made to fail. Moreover, um, rural post offices, particularly the third and fourth class level rural post offices, uh, were not allowed to offer it. So the whole rationale for postal savings was to serve the countryside in inaccessible places, and we weren't doing that. Very effective. Uh, another reason postal savings fades into oblivion in 1966 is that in the meantime, new mechanisms of small savings surfaced in the United States uh, that were quite effective in the middle of the 20th century. And we need to think about this for a minute. Postal savings, to a certain extent, was superseded by new institutions for small savings. What were these? Well, one was one we know very well, the U.S. Savings Fund actually originates in the mid-1930s, but it really comes into its own as war bonds during World War II, and in the decade or two after World War II. U.S. savings bonds became a very accessible form of saving. In some ways, it was America's best answer to the Postal Savings Bank elsewhere. A U.S. savings bond also was guaranteed by the U.S. government. It was highly accessible in a way that small savers accounts had not been in the U.S. before. Uh, you could get it at schools, you could get it at the workplace, which is a very effective way to be savings. Uh, you could get it from neighborhood volunteers, you could get it at the post office, you could get it in banks. So that was one thing that competed with postal savings and did a very good job. Another thing was the introduction of FDIC. Established in 1934, the somewhat weaker insurance system for savings and loans. They got the, the weaker system for savings and loans a little more firmed up in the early post-war period. And so Americans suddenly, in, in, in contrast to the, the 100 years before bank panics and that, Americans realized that they could save in banks that were now insured. And that was very important. That was another one of America's answers to postal savings. Rather than having necessarily everything done by the public sector, you can have this federally managed system of insurance for deposits. And so people after World War II really streamed back to the banks, and particularly to the savings and loans associations, which in a sense became our answer to the savings banks elsewhere. And so in the 50s and 60s, savings and loans were highly accessible. They usually required very low minimum balances, didn't come with many fees. 
uh, savings and loans were all over the place. So it's a very accessible system. So in a sense, the U.S. savings bond, the savings and loan, um, managed to displace uh, the postal savings uh, system, which in, from the start, as I said, hadn't been very effective. Um, however, what has happened in recent decades, as I think many of you know, is that these mid-20th century institutions for small savings uh, have declined or disappeared. The savings and loans, of course, um, collapsed in the 1980s. Uh, what few remain aren't really savings and loans anymore, they're just regular banks. Uh, the U.S. savings bonds, well, how many of you have large numbers of savings? U.S. savings bonds, uh, it used to be the practice. Uh, they're now actually quite inaccessible. You can get them, you can only get them online now. Uh, they, in a sense, are also designed to fail, I would say. Uh, credit unions could have perhaps played the role of savings banks elsewhere. They have done a good job. I think they should be encouraged, but they've never reached a mass market within the small savings industry. So, so we have a situation today in which we really don't have an effective institution for small savings. Uh, and so that's what brings me to talking about why I think we need postal savings. It does not appear, uh, and I don't know whether people agree with me or not, that the commercial banking sector does not appear that the commercial banking sector is particularly interested in promoting small savings, uh, certainly for lower income young people, high minimum balances, high fees, all sorts of things that have tended to discourage people. So into this vacuum, it seems that postal savings might actually be an idea that has come back. If it seems unhinged, we simply need to look abroad. When we look abroad, we see something that, that's actually quite curious. Um, many people in the finance industry in the late 20th century predicted that with a growing financial diversity in products, that a 19th century institution like the Postal Savings Bank would more or less disappear. It would be redundant. Uh, and they said, well, okay, maybe you'll see them in developing countries, but you're not going to see them in the first world. Uh, but lo and behold, uh, in the last 10 years or so, uh, as people have taken stock, that in many advanced countries, as, as, as uh, some of the evidence up here suggests, uh, postal savings and postal financial services are actually thriving, uh, in, particularly as you can see in Japan, Germany, France, the Netherlands, Switzerland, and Belgium. Uh, I mean, you could list many other countries. Uh, the other thing that's very interesting, and the one that I think we really need to pay attention to, is what it means for the post office itself. In these other countries, they're facing their post offices are facing exactly the same problems ours are: declining revenues because of delivery services. The internet is everywhere. Private sector delivery services are everywhere. So this is a common problem. French face it, Japanese face it, Japanese face it, etc. And it is interesting that in many of these other countries, that as a way of modernizing, the post offices have actually expanded their array of postal financial services beyond postal savings. And it's actually been a major revenue producer, such that it has, in many senses, compensated for the decline in delivery services and allowed post offices and post office branches to remain viable, as the second quotation from a uh, USPS study suggests. So, with that in mind, I'd like to look at um, just very quickly at three of the major postal saving systems, what we might be able to learn from that. Uh, and then we'll, we'll go into the summary and then open it up for questions. Uh, the Japanese postal system, as we said, this is the giant. Uh, many people would say it's too large. I would tend to agree with it, but let me at least tell you about it. Uh, it has 24,000 branches or more, which is amazing. I mean, this makes it not only the largest in terms of actual savers, but the largest in terms of its network. Um, traditionally, it offered simple savings accounts, but also a very popular 10-year time deposit based on the certificate of deposit. And it also offers something that, that uh, uh, might be imaginable here, but very interesting, something called postal life insurance. Basic life insurance policies you can actually get at the post office. So for this reason, these are very popular financial products. Um, and in terms of what it accomplished, in terms of financial inclusion, the post office and post office savings bank in 20th century Japan was pivotal in terms of financial access. Uh, I interviewed 
um, a, an official within the Bank of Japan in charge of information on, on saving the financial products. And I said, what are your policies for financial inclusion? In other words, including lower income people? And she laughed and said, well, we don't really have them anymore. We solved that problem 100 years ago with the spread of postal savings. And she was right. Uh, because what postal savings did in Japan and in other places is it actually has a knock-on effect. It actually set policies for the banking sector in general. So the banking sector in Japan is regulated much like the post office. Regular banks in Japan legally have to accept tiny deposits and uh, they can't impose maintenance fees. I mean, that's the law and it's set up for financial inclusion. We're going to see this in other places too. Now, you may have read that the Japanese Post Office Savings Bank is being privatized. Um, you're going to read that for a long time because it's never really going to happen. Uh, it's been a very long, unwieldy process. It started with a maverick reformer around 2005. Uh, it was supposed to have a 10 year process of privatization, and then new leadership came in that wanted to actually save postal savings. So it, it's not happening. However, ironically, the privatization process actually, in a sense, re strengthened postal savings by introducing a lot of new sort of private public financial products to the postal savings system. Uh, so uh, introduced mutual funds, uh, which you get at the post office, you get new credit debit cards, small loans, all sorts of products and annuities, uh, some of which involve partnering with private financial firms. So in a sense, these private financial firms, and this is not only a Japanese story, found that there was kind of a win-win situation, that the postal savings was going to be there forever, they weren't going to be able to dislodge it, um, but they could join it. They could join it and they could avail themselves of the vast network offered by these 24,000 um, postal uh, uh, post office savings branches. So it's again a lesson that we might think about that the post office could actually be attractive as a place for private financial firms to partner with and to offer new products. Um, but one last thing I should say, and this is the most controversial element in the Japanese system, is that um, the postal deposits for the most part are invested in government securities. Uh, it used to be 100%, now it's about 75%. Um, this strikes many economists as a big problem. It tends to suck out too much capital into the public sector. Um, but we need to be very clear here. Postal savings has two components. It has a service component, actually serving customers. And then there's the question of where the money is invested. It doesn't have to be entirely invested in the government. Obviously, it has to be invested conservatively, but we don't have to take the Japanese model 100%. You can actually separate the bringing in the savings and how the savings are invested. That should be the subject for today. Now, I want to turn to another system, the French system. There are some resemblances to the Japanese. I think, in many ways, the French system offers some very attractive models to us. Uh, like the Japanese system, uh, it's, it's heavily centralized at this point. In fact, it's even more centralized, and there's been no privatization of the French postal savings system. Um, most of the monies from postal savings are invested in a state-managed fund controlled by Ministry of Finance, and interestingly enough, most of it is dedicated to what the French call social housing. We call public housing, but it's very different because it's not just Housing, building housing for the very poor. Social housing in Europe often is middle class, uh, lower middle class, and lower income. Uh, and so it's a vast system of subsidized housing, which is partly paid for by uh, the postal deposits. But again, you don't have to follow that model to simply describe it. Like Japan, an extensive system of postal branches. Uh, and, um, and also, like Japan, part of an explicit policy of government mandated financial inclusion. I mean, there are laws in France that mandate that post offices and banks serve lower income customers at a low price, and, 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 and banks and post offices are committed to it. So again, we have this kind of knock-on effect of postal savings actually stimulating more inclusive policies in the commercial banking sector as well. And you can see very high levels of financial inclusion in France, 99% of households have bank accounts. Now, the centerpiece of the French system and a, and, and a device that, that I think is really interesting for us. In French, it's called the livre A. It just means like the A savings book. 
Uh, it's been in existence for almost 200 years. Um, it was historically offered at just post offices and the state uh, managed savings banks. But because of complaints from the EU that, that the French post office would have really locked things up and was monopolizing this product, uh, since 2009, the Livre A, the small savers account, is now offered at all banks in France. And, it, and it's interesting that it went that way. If it were our country, we'd probably shut down the effective savings interest. It, uh, instrument, um, and then nobody would have it here. It was actually the public uh, instrument was actually spread to the rest of the country. So, what is the Libre Auto? Why is it attractive? Well, it's a small savers account, explicitly, legally. Uh, it is capped at uh, currently at 15,300 euros, a little short of $20,000, one per person. I know some of you are saying, don't the French cheat, don't, don't, don't allow middle class families and stockpile these. To some extent, but not as much as you'd expect. I mean, they're, they're about, uh, I think they're about 49 million Libre Avis, about 60 French, uh, 61 Frenchmen. Uh, so the cheating is not extensive. Most people, in fact, do uh, do what the policy is designed for. They have one of these. And uh, obviously, for lower income, it's often the only one. So it's capped. No fee. Very tiny minimum balance. You can bring in a deposit of, I believe, 10 euros, uh, that, that is the minimum, so it's, it's almost no minimum whatsoever. Uh, the interest on the Libre uh, is tax exempt. Uh, and interestingly enough, the government, not the market, actually sets the interest rate. Now, we might not like that, uh, but that is what's done, and it's not usually wildly different from the market rate, but sometimes it's a little bit above the market rate, and prime ministers will, and presidents will defend it by saying there is a social goal um, associated with promoting small saving among lower income people, and we're going to pay a little bit more. It's a subsidy. We subsidize all sorts of things in this country. That's what they choose to subsidize. So that's the French system. And then I'm going to close with the German system. Um, and that one is quite different. It is now actually a privatized post bond. Uh, it, uh, it's privatized in part because unlike the other two countries I've talked about, and unlike most other countries, uh, Germany for the last 200 years has been very well served by a very accessible network of savings banks at the local level. They're called Sparkassen and also cooperative banks at the local level. Uh, the, sa the savings banks themselves, 50 million accounts, 50 million customers, the cooperative banks, 30 million customers. So the post bank, they just have a kid that will 14 million, which is still pretty good. But um, the point being that the post bank actually comes historically late to Germany because it's being the small savers already being fairly well served. Nonetheless, it does well, it does well with young people, it does well with lower income people. Uh, it has a lot of branches, although not as many as the French and Japanese, but still very extensive. Um, this is a picture I actually took two weeks ago. It didn't come out very well on PowerPoint, but uh, was good in person, uh, but it's, uh, I just saw people streaming into this post bank finance center, um, very, very popular um, and, and, and very accessible. Now, it's privatized because from about the 1990s, the post bank was spun off as a big, first a public corporation, but then the, the, the one that would actually be sold for shares. Finally, in the last four years, it's been acquired more or less in full by Deutsche Bank. Which is odd. The Deutsche Bank is a big commercial bank that has really no need for small customers, very criticized for not serving small customers. Deutsche Bank thought that by acquiring the Post Bank, that this would give them an entree to the small savers market. And in a sense, that has happened. Uh, now, it's not necessarily been that profitable for Deutsche Bank, but uh, Deutsche Bank has left it intact, not trying to carve it up. Uh, they're trying to be cost cutting, and unions have actually fought back. So it actually post in terms of customers remains quite vibrant, even though it has been privatized. And the privatization, as in the case of the semi privatization in Japan, has brought certain new products that are quite appealing not only savings accounts, debit accounts, but now mortgages. Uh, and DHL, the DHL delivery service, which is a German company, is actually part of the post bond. So you can go in and get all sorts of services in the post bond. And it remains popular. Well, let me sum up, um, and maybe we'll talk more extensively about this in the QA. The case for postal uh, financial services in the United States. 
And you know, the first thing I would say is, you know, looking at the various options, credit unions, or somehow trying to get commercial banks to serve small customers uh, in, in an accessible way, thinking about the various options, I can't think of another option that would be come anywhere close to the postal savings system in terms of serving the needs of the unbanked and underbanked and doing it on a nationwide basis. This would, while it may sound complex, it's not that complex, and it could be done rather quickly, and it would, I think, serve their needs quite well. The second point is one, just to repeat what I said, that postal financial services elsewhere have shown that that is a way of keeping post offices viable as, uh, as delivery services decline. Uh, moreover, uh, we can be creative and think about what's happening in the world now and what we, in fact, have done in our own post office. There is an array of uh, postal financial services that could be offered, not only savings accounts and checking accounts and debit cards, uh, but uh, things that the post office actually does now. Money orders, uh, domestic, international money orders, we now do electronic international money orders, uh, so that's not much of a leap at all. And other uh, post offices could partner uh, with private companies, as we've seen in Germany, Japan, elsewhere, uh, for prepaid cards, and a whole array of things that would serve uh, the currently underbanked and lower income and usable customers. Uh, moreover, um, there is this knockout effect uh, that when postal savings was first introduced in the United States, um, when it was up in congressional debate in the early 1900s, interestingly enough, that was the very point that the commercial banks started to offer their own small savers accounts because they, they saw competition coming. The postal savings system doesn't have to monopolize the small saver. Um, it, has to, it can actually stimulate the commercial banks to realize that they might too be able to offer small savers products at more attractive rates than they currently are doing. So it had this not on effect in overall financial inclusion. Um, whether the, a lot of people say, how could the post office possibly handle money? Well, they do now. Okay. And, and this, was, this has been a historic pattern. In 1861 in Britain, people in Parliament said, how can the post office handle money? And the same answer came back. The British post office is already handling money orders. Uh, we have money orders, we have international transfers, the lead to small savers accounts, basic financial services is simply not that great. Uh, and then, as I said, it needn't be seen as a total government monopoly. Post offices offer networks that could easily partner with private firms. So I'll just close by saying, you know, what I said at the beginning, Americans don't often like to think about other models and best practices in the world, but we've got some big crises and challenges today, and this may be a good time. Start. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. It uh, seems to you have all the angles covered. Uh, but I'm sure there's somebody in the audience that has holes that they would like to poke or questions that they would like to ask. So uh, I, I would invite that. Um, uh, if there are burning questions that folks have, I, I do want to preempt with, with one thought. Um, you know, Access today here in the U.S. Um, when we talk about the unbanked, we talk about the underbanked. Oftentimes, what we what we hear back is, that, well, listen, these are these are people in many cases who sort of disqualify themselves from uh, participating in the banking system by abusing accounts, overdrafting repeatedly. Uh, they ended up in the in the check system, uh, and they you know, they have terrible credit. Uh, how is that issue sort of addressed through international? Is, is, is bad behavior overlooked? Is it, uh, is it just accepted as sort of some people are going to behave badly? How is that handled? Is it the time? Uh, is it this my time? Yeah, I think it is. The time? Uh, well, I mean, it's, it's interesting that the problem doesn't come up as much. Now, it could be that everybody else in the world just is better behaved. Uh, but I think the, the better answer is that in places like Japan and France, they believe that financial inclusion is such an important social goal that they're, going to, they're willing to tolerate small amounts of abuse. I mean, in France, it's very interesting. They really have pushed hard for people receiving social benefits to be fully banked. Um, and that is something I think that, that probably may be coming here, although we don't do it as a commitment, because 
because it's much more efficient to arrange transfers when people have bank accounts. So in France, about 92% of the very poorest people um, are banked. So French and Japanese would say, you know, the overriding goal is social inclusion. And they would use words like that, and they're just going to tolerate a little bit of abuse on the corners. It's interesting, you know, I mean, I think you can almost sort of think of the postal services, uh, uh, and I don't want to go too far down this road, but it's, it's administered in many ways as a civil right. You know, every community in the U.S. essentially has access to the postal service. If you live in rural Alaska, tremendous uh, lengths are taken to ensure that you have access to the postal service the way that, that other, uh, other Americans do. And I think, you know, there's a question in our field about sort of banking access and whether this should be seen as a civil right or not. And, uh, you know, I think answering that gets a lot more complicated as we move more and more towards electronic payments of government benefits. Uh, and I think that you're right that there's a case to be made for sort of uh, simplifying uh, payments uh, if people are involved in the same structures uh, uh, at the large scale. Um, let's open it up to questions. Are there uh, folks out there that uh, I'm right in front here? Yes. Well, I'll repeat your question to the better of the microphone the rest of the audience. Well, I, I appreciated everything you said, uh, but I found one emphasis was coming in only at the end and too little, namely that is postal checking. Mm -hmm. I'm very familiar with the Swiss system, which is somewhat similar to the German, mm -hmm. but the way uh, post finance but its strength is by offering virtually the only way to pay bills. You could only really have a checking account with the post office. The banks charge too much. So you had uh, virtually the whole population making their payment at the post office through postal checking. And there was a little step that you said, you know, you bring us the money, that's what we transfer. Why don't you have your own account? And that's how it really began, much more so than the two postal safety. Uh, that's a very good point. I don't know if you all heard the question, but uh, the gentleman's from Switzerland. You must have lived in Switzerland. I was talking about the Swiss system, the German system, uh, and, and there is confusion because if you uh, actually talk about checks in Europe, people start laughing. They, they think Americans are very quaint because we use paper checks because very few Europeans do it instead. Their idea of checking is it's called a bureau, but uh, and it's these transfers that Donald was talking about. Uh, and it's not confined only to post offices in Japan. Um, I mean, I used to always have my bank. My bank would arrange for all my utility payments. And of course, we are finally doing that in the US, although this happened like 30 or 40 years earlier in much of the rest of the first world. Uh, so uh, the idea that they, it, so, uh, in America, I think people probably still need checking accounts, although maybe 10 years from now they may not, uh, because things are more and more electronic. What the post office could do is what you know, places like Walmart are doing now, uh, bill payment systems, or our banks do it now, that, that would be a very good uh, small savers product. So it's, again, yes, it's, it's, it's comprehensive, and although we say postal savings, now it's really postal financial products. Yeah, uh, in the back. Sort of in a different angle. So you talk about the ways the post office already handles money. Most of those tend to be sort of one-off transactions. How difficult is it to create the kind of infrastructure needed to do personal savings, online access to that savings account, so that you walk in and there's, you know, here's my account number, that whole personal system. How difficult is it to set up that kind of infrastructure? Well, I mean, I, it's a lot difficult to set up the system. Um, you know, I. I'm a historian, so I don't have the financial products really up close, but I can tell you that, uh, I mean, nobody's had problems creating them from, from scratch, and I don't think just because we're in electronic age that it's particularly hard. Um, I mean, banks are set up all the time. Uh, this is a nationwide network, to be sure. I, I don't think it's a, it's a formidable problem. We have uh, uh, on the right, and then we'll, um, well, we have two on the right, and then one on the left. Hi, my question is, what do you feel or how will it benefit via the banking system structure versus the postal system structure if it's this historical um, process? We you know banking in its historical realm has always been a process of the larger market, the framework of um, how it enforces or impacts the social networks, whereas we have a banking system that's going to come from a postal service, a postal service 
but yet not have the same impact and financial means on social networks? What would be the difference? Because we're looking at low income or poor people being able to utilize this system or this network, but yet um, how will it impact the way in which the economy will be able to um, gainfully um, obtain from this its tax, its revenues, and things that the banking system usually collects to go back into the system? So how would that network? Yeah, uh, it's a good question. So it, the thing that's always a little complex about a postal system, and, and of course this is true in any other country where it's still government control, is that it resembles a financial institution, but it's not quite. Um, now, I mean, interest rates is one thing. I mean, they can be set by market for the postal savings system just as they are in the bank. Uh, taxes is always interesting, uh, and, uh, and, and that's where politics gets into this, uh, that uh, uh, banks will charge, as, as they do in Japan today, banks will charge about the Japanese postal savings system that it's getting a tax subsidy uh, from the U.S. government. You know, it's not paying for its buildings, and it's certainly not getting taxed on things. So let's say it's unfair competition. Uh, I mean, that needs, this is true, it needs to be taken into consideration, but uh, we need to understand that sometimes there is a difference between public services and profit making, and we certainly have other examples of that in this country. Uh, and, uh, you know, we have to decide as a people politically uh, do we, we subsidize all sorts of things here. We subsidize home ownership by the affluent, we subsidize retirement savings by the affluent. Our tax law does all sorts of subsidies, some might say a little perversely. Uh, this is one where we can say we might agree, we may not agree, but we might agree as a society that this is a need that's not being served well by the market, uh, where a public service, one that albeit it's going to have various types of subsidies, does that. I mean, there are subsidies for our financial industry as well, but we, we don't have to talk about that. Uh, Steve? Uh, a very interesting presentation. Thank you very much. I, I think this last point is a critical one because Right now, the postal service is probably going to lose $14 billion this year. They've lost tens of billions over the last two years. So, and then there seems to be no appetite to try to subsidize it. The appetite seems to be how do you downsize it? How do you increase revenues? How do you reduce costs? How do you make it a self sufficient um, government enterprise as it was designed since 1970? And so now the question becomes. Is post, our postal savings account an opportunity to generate new revenue? You have these facilities out there, you have mail lines going down, fewer visits to post offices by customers. Maybe this is a way of leveraging, of making greater use of existing facilities and sort of getting more economies to scale that way. Uh, or is it in fact going to be the case that the postal services lose money by offering bank services because of the various subsidies for social purposes that you've just talked about that seem to be part of the deal in Japan, France, and elsewhere. So, so my question is, is there any evidence that the postal system could make money operating small accounts, an area where commercial banks have gotten out because they don't think they can make money doing it? Is there any evidence, either from abroad or from past experiences in this country, that this can actually be a revenue generator net, net for the postal service? Well, that's what, uh, I mean, I, a, a couple of uh, images back. Uh, that has been the findings by a number of studies of international, uh, the one at the bottom of uh, international postal services, that a, a sharp rise in the amount of revenue uh, coming from postal financial services uh, and and, the, and these various partnerships. As you say, you've got the infrastructure there already, and in these other countries, the private sector firms often recognize this and see it as a good opportunity to partner. Uh, so, I mean, when we say, I mean, because the buildings are already there and being paid for, I mean, part of that cost is, I mean, it's not totally fixed, but, but a lot of it is already there. So, um, yes, there, there was a lot of it. I mean, a lot of evidence in these European cases, and especially in Japanese cases, they're doing very well. And I, I would add, as a piece of evidence, uh, the non-traditional non financial services sector in the U.S. that caters largely to low-income Americans and, and largely to unbanked and underbanked Americans uh, is a 
multi, multi billion dollar business. And anybody who's been up here and who's tried to uh, do something or been in the state capital and tried to um, uh, rein that business in a little bit has seen uh, they have resources to bear and they don't have resources to bear because they're giving services away. There's a question right here. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, very interesting, and I do think that uh, here in the States we do uh, sometimes take a very narrow perspective on what's actually happening in the global, um, the global landscape. So I think it's some very interesting information. But under PAEA, which was enacted in 2006, uh, does currently, does the Postal Service have the latitude to provide financial services today, or does that require some legislative adjustments? Well, I just, actually the report there on the bottom speaks to that issue, uh, and it's murky. Um, you know, I mean, if you read the letter of, of that law, it, it looks like the post office is prevented from engaging in anything other than what, postal services, right? Is that the phrase? Uh, but, uh, but they grandfathered some things, and they grandfathered in, you know, some public services like passport and stuff and things like that, including things for the government. Uh, and then there, there were some rulings, or at least one major ruling, uh, whether, whether they could continue to offer money orders. Uh, and that stuff, again, probably mainly because it's partly grandfathered, partly fudged in the ruling. It was said because money orders are things that you can send by mail, but of course that's becoming less and less true. If they're electronic, they're obviously not being sent by mail. But they, so the, the sense, at least in this report that, that I cite here, is that um, money transfers are probably okay uh, under the law. I mean, somebody may try and test it, but it looks like they're okay, including electronic transfers. And so the post office may be able to get much more into domestic electronic transfers, which you can do a lot. I mean, you get into bill payment and things like that. And then there's a question about what about things like offering prepaid cards? Uh, that gets pretty murky. Uh, you know, the report's about maybe, but you know, I mean, I think what we're dealing with, uh, um, again, I'm a historian, I'm not a policymaker, but it seems to me we are. In Congress, I mean, I think this law's got to be changed. It's got to be modernized. It's, I mean, there's no other postal system in the first world that has these sort of restrictions, and they just can't cut it. Let's do one last question right uh, uh, behind the lady. Are there any um, examples of this sort of a system in North America or South America? Oh, postal savings? Oh, yes, extensive. Um, use of South America, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I didn't, I didn't mention the developing world because, you know, I didn't think anybody would think there was a model to one from the developing world. But postal savings is the major form of small saving in a lot of the developing world. Brazil is a huge system. Um, that's probably the one that people look at most. But, but I think nearly all the South American countries have postal savings. And I'm not sure it's true about South America. We have uh, we have reached our witching hour, and I want to be respectful of everybody's time. I, I do want to make Shell available for questions afterwards. I'm available for questions afterwards, and particularly if uh, folks are interested in sort of exploring the you know, the nitty gritty of this uh, issue, um, we can you know we're, we're available to do that. Um, I'd like to thank our sponsors from the Congressional Savings and Ownership Caucus, uh, and all of you for being here today. Uh, thank you all so much. Uh,